Hey, 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 everybody. How are you doing? I hope you are well. I'd love to know that you are here and you are with us. Please let me know in your chat. I can see that there are a bunch of you here already. So welcome to the first ever e-bass guitar YouTube live stream. This is called How to Kick Off Your Beginner Bass Guitar Journey. So please do let me know that you are there in the chat. Um, I'd love to know what your New Year resolution, if you've got one for playing the bass guitar is. Um, I would love to know what bass guitar you play. Um, I'd love to know what song you are working on. So please do let me know that in the chat and then we will get going. So we have a ton of questions that I've been submitted here and we also have one in the chat as well. So let, hello, let me just say hello to a few people who are here. Richard Golding, hey Richard, uh, Jay Bartlett, Jack Baker, good to see you there. Kay Bueno, I hope I'm pronouncing that. James, more practice. So let me know what bass guitar you play in the chat. I would love to know that. And then we've got a ton of questions. I'm gonna probably go for about half an hour here. Um, and yeah, just let me know also if you can't hear any audio, or if you've got, there are any audio problems or anything like that that we need to fix. But it's good to see so many of you here on YouTube. So let's get straight down to it. First question that's in, um, I love this question. It is from Lee Hopkins and he says, how do you make sure that your practice time is the most productive and that you're working on the things that you need to? Right, this is where we have a very simple system over here at eBass Guitar called the 3M system for um, practice. And basically that is a three sections that you can carve your practice into. So 3M stands for this, mechanics, mind and music. So the mechanics section is you wanna practice something that's technical, okay? You wanna do something that improves your technique, that gets your mechanics going on the instrument. You then wanna practice something which is musical as well. So you wanna practice something new. Um, so I've got that the wrong way around. Let's start, you wanna practice mind. You wanna learn something new. And then the third part is music, that you wanna just spend some of your practice time playing music. And I would recommend practicing or splitting your sessions into thirds. So if you've say got half an hour to practice, I would do 10 minutes on mechanics, 10 minutes on mind, learning something new, and 10 minutes just having fun playing music. If you've got 15 minutes, split it into five. If you've got an hour, split it into 20 minute sessions. This is just very, very loosely um, to get you going. So let me know if you've got any questions about that regarding that in the chat. Um, and I would say that that is actually detailed. The 3M system for uh, practice is over in my book, The Essential Guide to Technique. I'm going to feature today a little bit of one of our best selling books here. This is the Bass Guitar Foundations Guide. So I'm going to show you what's in there. If you're looking to kickstart your new year, this book is a great start. We've sold uh, God, thousands upon thousands of copies of this now. People do love it. And so if you haven't already seen it, I'd love you to get your hands on it. We'll get the team to put a, a link to this in the chat so that if you want to grab a copy, you can. So let's get down to the next question. What would you say is the most useful scale to learn first as a novice bass player? This comes from Kevin Wilkinson. So there are two scales that I would say you should learn straight away. One is for a musical application and one is to have fun with. Right from the word go, you need to understand the major scale. So this scale here, C major. This major scale is the backbone of pretty much 
of all of Western music, I'd say. And you can derive probably 80% of pop rock music directly back to the concepts which sit within this particular scale. There is so much in it. Thousands upon thousands upon thousands of songs are based on the harmonic concepts which sit within this major scale. So I recommend starting to integrate that into your practice right from the word goes. The studies of the major scale, this scale, these seven notes that are within there can get pretty deep. And so I would recommend um, starting with it slowly and just learning it over time. Now, in terms of the, in terms of the scale that you should learn to jam and have fun with, there's one scale in my opinion that that this is the one to do it with, and it is the legendary minor pentatonic scale. So if you've got your bass out, you can play it with me right here. So we're going to do this in the key of G. And so the notes of this are G, a B flat, a C, a D, an F, and a G, like this. And this is where you can get some great, great sounds out of the instrument. So many great bass lines have done it. So I'm going to have a little jam on it so that you can kind of see um, there. Let me just get some drums up. So let me get a, just a straight pop groove going on here. Let's choose 100 beats per minute. Can you hear this okay? Can you hear the drums okay? Let me know in the chat. Okay, hands up, I did add a couple of extra notes in there at the beginning, but pretty much the vast majority of that was all bang on minor pentatonic scale there. So that is the first scale that I would get down there. It is in the book here, the um, Bass Guitar Foundations Guide. I can just see my team have put a link in the chat there. So make sure you check that out there. Um, so those are, the, those are the two scales which I think are really, really great. Please do ask questions in the chat. We're going to go out for about half an hour, 40 minutes. If you're liking this YouTube format, please do let me know in the chat uh, as well. Um, yes, Rick T, will this be recorded and available for review later? Absolutely. This is one of the reasons we're putting on YouTube so more people can get it um, and get access to this. Um, so someone in the chat has actually answered the question. Um, what well, actually directly we had a question through which says Jay can you tell us about your P bass um, so what strings are there uh, what strings are on your P bass here so let's talk gear just briefly for a moment we'll segue from music straight into gear um, on this bass guitar here I have tomastic flat wound strings these are low tension flats which I absolutely love on this particular bass guitar now, quick caveat, they're not to everyone's taste. I know that one. I've had various debates with people about them over the years, and that's completely cool. Um, for those of you who aren't aware who Tomastic are, Tomastic are very, very well known for making double bass strings. So um, Tomastic strings are, um, the Tomastic jazz strings are one of the most common jazz strings used. I think even the great Ray Brown might have used it, but don't, don't quote me, but they're there of that level strings. And Tomastic do make a set of, uh, of the same strings which go on the, um, on the bass guitar, uh, which work for the bass guitar. And they have similar properties to the double bass strings. Um, 
So those are the P-Base, those are the strings that I use on this particular P-Base to give that older retro sound. I love this, the, there's so, there's so much, there's so much that you can do. There's so much kind of skank and funk and stuff like that within these strings there. Yeah, uh, someone said in the chat, are, are they different to the Tomastic Jazz Flats? I believe they're the same things. The, the, I believe they're the same things. I'm not an authority on Tomastic strings. I'm going to say that. I've just owned the double bass strings and these strings over the years. So please do go to their website and ask there. Um, but if you want to know more about this P bass, I can tell you the story of the P bass in the live stream later. Um, also, eBay's guitar mugs are available too, if you want to go to our merch on the, the website. Um, so someone has asked, uh, how do you know which notes to play in the minor pentatonic? Um, that's a really interesting question and comes with a certain amount of experience, which obviously we are more than happy to give you over at ebassguitar.com um, over in the bass lab. I'm sure the team can put a link to the bass lab there um in there um but really the key to creating those riff, those riffs that i was doing i will play it just very briefly again because this is a great question okay if i take that the real anchor in that phrase is what's on the first beat of our bum, bum, ding, and then really you can start to experiment with other stuff within there. As long as you have some anchor, some core note to come back to. So that is what I recommend. Now within there, there is the legendary box shape. So. So if you just want to start off with that, that is a great little riff to play over it. So I hope that gives you some insight. That was a very quick one. We could do, I could take this apart in a lot of depth for you, but that will give you there. Someone's just said pricey strings, the Tomastics. Yes, they are. But the flip side of this pricey, the pricey strings is you virtually never have to replace them. So, um, cause <laughs> I have no intention of uh, replacing these strings in a long time. Um, could you use the minor pentatonic is another fill that's come in from Hobbain. Could you use the minor pentatonic over uh, over a major chord progression? Yes, you can. You just got to be careful that um, you don't labour too much on the minor third. Okay. If you play the notes that will clash, it will sound awful. But if you use it correctly, it can work. Um, particularly if you're going to blue stars where there's often minor over major. That can work really nicely. So it's got to be used carefully, but it can be there. Um, cool. How do you know? So, uh, Sandy, you have, what other questions have come in? Is there a way to locate a tab for a walking bass line for a jazz standard? Um, Yes, absolutely. Um, God, this is a bit of a pitch for all of the books that I've ever written. And the one I need is on my bookshelf over there. Um, but The Essential Guide to Walking Bass will teach you how to play walking bass from the ground upwards. With all the examples in the book, um, I always put everything in there for standard notation and tablature. So I don't, um, I always like to cater for both modalities of learning there. And there is a whole jazz standard tabbed out there at the end of the book because the point of the book is to get you from playing your very first notes of walking bass to going to the, um, to actually playing a whole jazz standard all of the way through. And also, again, there's more of this as well with our Jazz Jam backing track album. We had um, a load of bass lines written out for those so that students can learn those as well. So. 
um, do check those out there. So there, there are plenty of places you can get um, tabs for um, uh, jazz standards. So yes, we can help you with that one. If you want to know about the P-Base, let me know in the chat. I'll keep teasing you about that one because there's a story behind that. Let's go into some more of the questions that we've had submitted here. So, um, right, let's, um, what's next? Uh, are there any exercises I can do to increase the reach of my fretting hand? So, how I teach students to increase the reach of the fretting hand, and I think we just had a question, how do you get bigger hands um, there? Right, I want to just answer what I believe is a total myth in this, that if you've got small hands, the bass guitar is difficult to play. There's one wonderful kind of antidote to that sen sentiment, and that's the wonderful, wonderful Tal Wilkenfeld, who is Jeff Beck's guitarist, an Australian, very petite Australian uh, lady um, who's been around probably for about 15 years now. Uh, and she's a wonderful, and she, she doesn't have huge hands, um, and so that proves that you don't need huge hands. The thing that's become very popular recently is um, short-scale basses as well. Um, so that can be a solution, um, but what I encourage you to do is do the stretch. I promise you I don't have huge hands. I've managed to make a living out of this game now for about 20 years. So you don't need them. But what I encourage students to do if you're struggling with the stretches is to learn proper technique, but do it on the upper end of the bass guitar down here and try and get everything working down there. Because if you can get the mechanics of this working, all these kind of exercises up here, then you just have to slowly keep moving them down here. But really the secret to, to playing in good fast bass it doesn't really lie in the size of your hands, although I'm not gonna lie that I do think bigger hands will can be advantageous in the situation. Um, I think it lies in working on good technique and working on good technique is up here. And so this is what I would work on doing then. So putting each finger down one by one like so, playing nicely behind the frets like that. Have I got another camera? I can show you there. Like so, so you can see really nicely up there. And that's what you want to work on. Um, and really, if you're struggling, the most, the biggest challenge is this third to the fourth finger that you see uh, with so many players, is just work on the first, second, and third. Get that good to begin with. And then when you're ready, add that fourth finger in like that. Don't grip too hard. You just want to maintain contact here with the strings just behind the fret. That's really what you do. If you look at what I've got going on there, they're attached, but they're not gripping super hard or anything like that. Um, so that is what I suggest doing there. Um, so work that up slowly and go further and further back. And then as the frets get a little bit bigger, the stretch will um, start to happen. I'm also a big fan also of using the four over three technique. Some people call this the Samandel technique. So, so one, two, and four like that. Certainly down here. So experiment with that too, but small hands definitely shouldn't be a hindrance. Um, cool. So let me know um, if you have any further questions. I can see them coming up in the chat there. Um, okay, over a G major, you can play E minor pentatonic. Yeah, absolutely. O, or an A minor pentatonic or a B. I'm not sure if this is um, 
a question or someone is uh, just uh, just uh, being helpful. But yeah, absolutely, over a G major, over G major, you can play the E minor pentatonic. Because um, all of those notes are in the G major scale. So for, and so if I, uh, If I do this again, I'll have some backing tracks set up so I can demonstrate the stuff so you can hear it. But all of those notes, the E is the sixth, the G is the root, the A is the second, the B is the third, the D is the fifth, and the E is the sixth. So all of those notes work really nicely, and it's great. It can give you some really, really nice um, major pentatonic fills for pop stuff. Um, it's a really good scale to use over the G major chord there. So guys, let me know, uh, the chat has cooled off a little bit. Let me know that you're still alive, you're still here. That's really nice uh, to know. And then I'll go through a, little, a few more questions at this stage. Well, yeah, we've got quite a lot of viewers on here live as well. So let me just go back um, to this. What is next? Um, can I incorporate some ear training into my practice? Are there some exercises you can recommend? Yeah, the first, um, I've actually been working on this today for our brand new Hear It Play It course. And the first exercise that I would do is learn what the intervals of the major scale sound like. Okay, so what does the root to the second sound like? What does the root to the third sound like? What does the root to the fourth sound like? Root to the fifth, root to the sixth, root to the seventh. And you can look at them as individual notes or as I've been doing for the Hear It Play It course, you can actually look at the chords that are on top of them and start, and start assigning sounds to them as well. So if you go from chord one to chord two, all right? The song that I always think of when that happens um, is the wonderful Amy Winehouse song, Valerie, that is vamping from chord one to chord two. Or if we're going from chord one to four, all right, dum. Um, that is the wonderful Respect by Aretha Franklin or something like that. That's a bit more like it. Something like that anyway. Um, but that is the chord sequence. So that is the first step. It's quite a deep subject to this, which is why I've got a set of 12 students starting to study this for 16 weeks with me at the end of the month. Um, but yeah, that is one of the best ways to start incorporating ear training is to learn to recognize sounds within there. Um, right, I've just temporarily lost the chat pad on my computer as well so i can't see what chat questions are coming in so if you if you can just bear with me whilst i uh find that ah there we are okay that's a beautiful fender james uh fender jazz bass uh one four here comes the bride yeah valerie zutons yeah um love your foundation book from bill mills got some great vi advice going on brilliant well if you haven't joined the Bass Lab Plus. Um, there's plenty more advice like this going on in there every day. So, um, cool, proper techniques for playing ghost notes. Um, um, ghost notes are really simple. There's nothing complicated about doing a ghost note. Okay, what I would do is play a regular note. So let's take a C like that. I would gently lift off and that will work as a ghost note. But the problem is if you play over a harmonic, like say that, you end up getting a harmonic. So the best thing to ensure a ghost note absolutely works is to lay down the rest of your fingers so you've got a couple of other fingers down there. You can, it could be two, it could be three, it could be four, whatever you wanna do, but try and have a couple of fingers in, down there to avoid harmonics. I tend to play quite hard to, uh, with harmonics, just to, harmonics? ghost notes just to get them. To 
to get them to a really to get them to really pop out like that. Um, ghost notes are kind of a rhythmic effect which just sound great in bass lines. Often you don't really hear them, they're just kind of there. Um, and you sort of miss them when they're not. Um, cool. Uh, what else have we got? Can this is from Robert Wilkins? Okay. Can, what valuable advice can you offer beginners like me who are eager to um, accelerate my learning process? Um, I'm going to be straight. Um, we've had great results from this book here. If you want to go deeper, you get good results from this. Go and check out the Base Lab Plus. But I want to just show you a concept um, from this, and it's from page 80 in here, because one of the other questions that we've got in here, which comes from um, Frank, and he says, can you um, demonstrate how to start creating fills and those sexy notes to get chords to link together. So I thought I'd do this and within the book there's a track called Mr. Countryside and just very briefly I'll give you the history of this track. Um, I've played on gigs hundreds of times the killer song Mr. Brightside and it is this chord sequence of D, G, B minor, A. So chord one, chord four, chord six, chord five like so um, and I created I started creating a backing track which sounded like um, was aiming to sound like the killers track but it was far too fast and if you wanted to play pumping eights over the top it was quite a pace for pe people who are in the beginning to early phase so what I did was I slowed it down and we ended up with this track which sounded like a country track. Um, anyway, let me play it. Let me find, I've got the backing track handy here. So, um, and you can hear it. And so what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna play long notes. Like that to begin with. And then so you can see it, and then I'll start um, getting it. Um, then I'll start building it out a little bit with some pumping eighth notes. So G, I've just put, sorry, I've just put on the wrong one. I want the backing track, which is track number 94. My apologies. This is live, it's uncensored. All mistakes are part of it. So there we go. That's the one. So this is just the root notes. Let's put it into some pumping eights. Now the question about how to start putting fills in there, the best way and I love teaching it this way, is to put what we call approach notes in there. And so what we're going to do is we've got everything here is derived from the D major scale. You remember I said earlier in this live stream, major scale is kind of important stuff. So, so the notes are D, E, F sharp, G, A, and then the B there. And this is the D major scale. And what we're going to do is we're going to approach every chord change from one scale note below. So we're going to approach every chord change from one scale note below. So we're going to have D to the G and to get there we're going to go via the F sharp in the scale and we're going to place that on beat four of the bar. So one, two, three, four, one, two, three. Then to get to the B we're going to go via one scale note below which is an A. So we end up with this, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three. And then to get to the A, we're gonna go one scale note below the A, which is gonna be a G, two, 
three, and then get back to the D, we're gonna go one scale note below there to buy a C sharp. And so we end up with this bass line. And it's really nice and melodic because all of the notes, strangely enough, come from the D major scale, which is the parent scale there. So I'm going to put that into context and so that you can hear this in action. So. Once you've got that idea down you can start messing around with it and exploring it you can also do uh, scalic approach notes from above as well which can sound really really nice you can mix them up this is just the tip of the iceberg um, so that is inside uh, page 80 of the bass guitar foundations guide right there if you want to start your bass guitar playing journey off right from playing your very first notes and do it really practically in a really practical way, um, that's what I'm trying to say, um, then this is a great way to do it. And by the end of the book, you will play your first full rock song from beginning to end. So that's what you can expect to achieve. We'll put links to that in the chat. Um, I'm going to go for about another five or six minutes. Um, and I just want to check the chat for any... Um, any last questions that are in there um so let me see i've lost the chat pad why does it keep disappearing for me um there we go what's let me see hold on oh there it is it's back it's back it's back uh base lab plus uh, it has it all for 200 bucks for a year is great learning value check it out so that's from rick castellanos there yeah brilliant um you guys have said it all. Um, I don't really need to <laughs> mention too much harder when there's guys like Rick putting it all in there. Um, the Bass Lab Plus is my full step-by-step -step program, which goes right from the beginning to making you a bass guitar gig ready player, ready to get out there and really do it. Um, so if you want to join a worship team, you want to um, join a cover band, you want to go to a jam session, it'll teach you all of the skills there. Um, so, that's there. Um, what last questions have we got here? Um, the questions keep coming in there. Any good ideas for acoustic bass tracks to practice? I'm going to be straight. I don't know the answer to that one. Acoustic. By, do the, by that, do you mean double bass? Um, or do you mean acoustic bass guitar? Interesting. Let me know that one in the chat. Um, okay. All right, question here. I'm going to do two more questions in here. I'm going to talk about the P bass, and I'm going to I'm going to talk about a diminished chord. Um, how? What do I play over a diminished chord? Now, diminished chords can be quite complicated beasts. Diminished chords are effectively chords that link two chords together. Now, the diminished chord is really interesting because it's not. Um, uh, it, the full diminished chord isn't related to the major scale. Um, it's kind of this sort of musical outlier and it's used a lot in blues music to link chords four to chords five together. But what makes the diminished chord kind of unique is it's all built on minor thirds. And so you get this wonderful pattern like that which you can play over the neck. So really, in, you know, from a practical application, when I play a diminished chord, I really work on that. I don't use too much of the diminished scales or anything like that. They can do, they can work, but really the most powerful thing, and it creates a really cool pattern on the fretboard that kind of crabs its way over, like so. So if you want to play an A diminished, for instance, the notes are A, C, shift one fret forward, go uh, E flat, G flat, and then you're up to the 
uh, you back up to the A and that pattern just keeps going. Like that. So that's really the simplest way of approaching a diminished chord. That beautiful sound like that. Um, so let's talk off one more question. Like someone's asked, what is the P bass here? Um, so the P bass here, I can't remember who asked it, but someone did. Um, the P bass here, this is the Hammer Octamu Signature Model P bass. Um, now, this was a really interesting uh, journey for me discovering this bass guitar. Uh, so I start, got lent a P bass um, about God, beginning of 2021, sometime around then, by a good uh, friend of mine called Kevin Dumford. Kevin is a fantastic bass player. Um, and back in the 80s, he was Pino Palladino's Depp in Paul Young's band. Um, so, um, so great caliber guy. And he lent me this P bass and he said, try it out, see if you like it. And it was a bass that, to all intents and purposes, looked a little bit like this. It was a Japanese PB70 uh, bass. And it had these strings on there and just played great. And it was the middle of all the lockdowns and that kind of stuff. I ended up having this bass for probably the best part of 18 months. But in the end, it needed to, unfortunately, go back to its, um, go back to its rightful owner. And so I thought, well, I need to, if I buy myself um, a mid-2000s Japanese Fender, I can't go wrong. Turns out it was nothing like Kevin's. I uh, got this thing out the case. I was going to film like this great reveal. I got it out, played the first few notes and went, I don't like this. Um, and I, re I realized the reason I didn't like that bass, um, and this just shows how you're always learning, was to do with the nut width up there. It had a P bass nut width, which is something like 40 or 42 mil, but a jazz bass has a nut width of about 36 up here. So it's a slimmer neck. And I had this P bass, it sat on the wall and I just didn't use it. In the end, I took it to local music shop down near where I live in a near a place called Ringwood, old fashioned music shop, which sells stuff on um, uh, commission. And they sold it and uh, after a few months uh, in there and got full asking price and then said it's the best piece P bass we've ever sold. And this was a P bass that I didn't like. It's, it was interesting how one bass isn't for somebody and it can be for the next person. So armed with the cash again this because i got full asking price and uh, for this base i thought i'm going to go on the hunt again and so kevin recommended this place called fender fever in london and i messaged them saying do you have can you get me a fender pb70 they said no we can't lay our hands on one of those at the moment in time but have you seen the hammer octomu signature model um, because i explained why i wanted that particular base and they said basically it's a P bass body with a jazz bass neck. And then it fell into place. That was what I really liked about it was the slimmer neck. Um, and they, so I looked around for this Hammer Octomu and there was nothing in the UK for it. And then I started to learn that there are a whole bunch of signature model Fender basses which don't really make it out of the Japanese and Austra Austra Australian market. Um, and so I thought, what the heck, let's order one on eBay and see what turns up. Um, and so I did that and this bass guitar turned up and it's pretty damn good. And so I really like it. My only criticism is it's a little bit heavier than I would like, but it sits nicely and for sitting down work and for all of this, it feels great, it sounds great, it does the it does the business. So I'm a very, very happy camper with this bass guitar. Um, but it just shows that I never realized, even after 20 years of playing, how crucial nut width was and what I really, really liked. So that is this, the Hammer Octomu bass. If you wanna try one out, you can get them on eBay and get them shipped around the world. Um, I've had a good experience um, with this one. It works really nice, it's really playable, sounds great with the strings on there. So that is this bass guitar. I'm gonna start wrapping things up right now um, because we've been going about 40 minutes, but let me know, I'd love to discover, have you enjoyed this YouTube live stream that we do? This is a test. If you like it, 
we can do more of these. Uh, Rick Castellanos is saying, great lessons from you on YouTube, James. Really appreciate the work and the attention you put into teaching. Thank you so much. Well, it's my, my pleasure doing that because I don't take you guys for granted and I love helping you um, really try and play the best pace you possibly can. That is my, that is my mission on there. Um, anyway, I'm going to leave it. I'm going to leave it there. I want to say thank you to all of you guys um, that are here. Um, it's really great. I can see that we've um, had a, quite a few number of viewers on here live and that's great. This recording will go up um, and so you can re-watch it here. So let's, um, let's leave it there guys. Thank you so much for um, joining me and please do give us the feedback if you'd like us to keep doing these more regularly because I'm up for it. So let's keep going. Thank you very much, guys. I will catch you soon. Let's leave it there.